Thanks everyone for coming. I'm Lynn Bryson and um, I help, I'm helping Lindsay out today. She is uh, vacationing. But Meredith is here, Meredith May, Dr. Meredith May is here, and she is going to do our presentation. And if she doesn't mind, I'm going to ask her to give a little bit more information. She is one of our board members, but she's also, she also has lots of other credentials that I would rather her tell you about. But thanks again for coming. All right, so um, I'm Dr. Meredith May. I am um, on the board of this museum. And I was asked to talk uh, today about some um, about a project I was a part of, and still am very much a part of, uh, called the Civil Rights and Black and Brown Oral History Project, which I'm going to talk about quite a lot today. Um, let's see, I'm originally from Huntington, so raise your hand if you know where Huntington is. All right, okay. So down near Lufkin. Um, if Lufkin was big enough to have suburbs, <laughs> Huntington would be a suburb of Lufkin. So that's where I grew up. Um, and then I went to SFA for a while, did bachelor's there, um, and I received my master's and PhD from TCU, um, which is how I got involved with civil rights in black and brown, because one of the main people who came up with the project um, is a professor there. So today, as the title suggests, we're going to be looking at Deep East Texas and the Civil Rights Movement. So before we get started, I wanted to address why we are looking at Deep East Texas today, the Lufkin and Nacogdoches area specifically, and not Gregg County, where we're sitting. That's because the Civil Rights and Black and Brown Oral History Project, our main focus for today, didn't do hardly any interviews in Gregg County at the time. Not very many in Smith either. Uh, we just didn't have enough people. <laughs> Instead, my partner and I were stationed in Lufkin and Nacogdoches in the summer of 2016. Um, and so today I'm going to share with you what we learned and what is going into our larger book project, um, which should be out next year. And before I dive into that, so we were going to have a video today, but the sound's not cooperating. Um, hearing from Herbert Cross, who was the assistant principal at Lufkin High when integration happened. And that's going to help us set the stage. So since we can't actually hear from Mr. Cross, I'm going to read to you what he said whenever we talked to him in the summer of 2016 about what it was like when Lufkin integrated. So this was in 1970. That was the year that Lufkin integrated. He said, I saw a large crowd in front of the school and it just kept getting bigger and bigger. So when the bell rang for school to take up, I said, let me go check this crowd. So instead of me going in the school on the side, I went to the front, because that's where all these people were. And I thought about when Moses parted the Red Sea, because when I got there, everybody had guns. Just all these white people out there, and every one of them had guns. And I got there, and they just kind of parted and made a little aisle for me to go down. They didn't say anything to me, and they let me through, but every one of them had guns. So I went through the front doors and asked the principal, Ed Casper, what is going on with all these white people out here? And he said, they won't let the blacks get off the buses. And I said, they wouldn't. He said, no. So they all went home. The buses just took them back home. So I said, well, I don't know what we're going to do. Then they called, and they were going to have a meeting at the superintendent's office. The Justice Department, the FBI, everybody was there. And so we met, and they said, if they're there tomorrow, we're going to arrest everybody. We're going to put them on school buses, take them to jail, book them. Nobody showed up the next day. <laughs> somebody in that meeting had told them. Somebody in the meeting knew about it. And the next day I said, well, that's one obstacle we're over. <laughs> so after a hard-fought resistance to integration, the federal courts forced Lufkin, Texas's schools to integrate under a court order that remained in effect until July 11, 2000. The day after Lufkin schools integrated, so the day after what Herbert Cross talked about, the local newspaper reported that everything had gone extremely well. <laughs> the principal, Ed Casper, told the Lufkin Daily News that, quote, everything went as smooth as possible under the conditions of the first day of school as the all-black Dunbar High and white Lufkin High combined. The paper of official record for Lufkin seemed to breathe a sigh of relief and moved on to other business. 
There was no mention in the paper of anyone showing up with guns. As smooth as possible, the lies the truth of what happened at Lufkin High on August 31st, 1970, when those white parents appeared with guns to prevent black students from entering the building. But it is the official narrative of integration and the broader civil rights movement in both Lufkin and the surrounding area. Lufkin and neighboring population centers, like Nacogdoches, did not experience the same publicized mass resistance or organizing that took place in other parts of the South and appeared on the nightly news. But that doesn't mean that they didn't have a civil rights movement or that marches, sit-ins, and other forms of direct action didn't occur, because it did. So, the Texas NAACP at mid-century described East Texas as, quote, the meanest part of the state. That is a direct quote from them. Racism was deeply entrenched in the towns and cities of deep East Texas. Lufkin remained, and remains to the 21st century, geographically segregated along racial lines. By the 1950s, African Americans in Lufkin were mostly confined to the northern part of the city. Downtown Lufkin, which is pictured in this postcard, was starkly segregated. Most African Americans, when asked to remember segregation in Lufkin when we interviewed them in 2016, vividly recounted a description of the separate water fountains in Perry Brothers, which you can actually see here on the right side of the street. It was a department store. Larry Kegler, who was one of the people we interviewed first, cited Perry Brothers' water fountain as the first time he really felt the impact of Jim Crow. He and other African Americans remember trying to sneak sips out of the white water fountain whenever the designated salesperson, tasked with watching both the water fountains and her sales area, was looking away. Others interviewed had a long list of places they could not go to or could only enter through the back and concurred that these combined to create an atmosphere of everyday indignities. In terms of school segregation in Lufkin, the incident at the high school at the beginning of our discussion was the middle in a much longer story that included years of separate education, protracted resistance prior to federal interference, and persistent problems following the beginning of integration. The schools in Lufkin and Nacogdoches, which also integrated in 1970, but they didn't have an armed mob show up, were some of the last to integrate in the entire nation. And it took place after years of unequal educational opportunities for African American students. Prior to integration, schools like Dunbar, the all-black high school in Lufkin, endured hand-me-downs and a lack of attention. Every former Dunbar teacher and student vividly remembered having used textbooks and used supplies. Larry Kegler noticed that the biggest difference between Dunbar and Lufkin High was that when he began attending Lufkin High, Quote, it was one of the first times that I saw books that didn't have 15 names already in it. White administrators resisted providing any kind of resources to the African American schools. Emma Jones Callagher, in her interview, remembered the white superintendent telling her in the 1950s that, quote, I'm sorry, but you people just can't learn science. Into the 1960s, Dunbar only had a biology course because they lacked the equipment to have a chemistry class. As surrounding schools integrated, including nearby Dywall, Lufkin doubled down when the federal government threatened to take over the school. Into the summer of 1970, Lufkin refused to comply with orders to integrate, instead choosing to continue to submit slightly modified versions of freedom of choice. If you're not familiar with what freedom of choice is, um, it's where the school district said that African Americans could choose to go to the white school, and white students could choose to go to the African-American school. Uh, almost nobody ever made those choices. Um, but it was their way around integration. So that didn't work. And in August, the school board frantically tried to come up with a plan to satisfy the courts. On August 17th, the new plan, which the government approved, was submitted. All students would attend Lufkin High. Dunbar would be used as a junior high for both white and African American students, and elementary students would be divided by a racial ratio. So the schools opened as planned on August 31st, and white parents came armed and prepared for a confrontation. The Klan staged a march through downtown Lufkin in preparation for the process and as a sign of their resistance. Considering the sheer numbers of white parents who came on the first day of school, 
Local businesses either supported the open revolt against integration taking place and let their employees take off from work, or they forgave them after the fact. Either way, no one feared being fired from their job for participating in the armed protest and aggression against the African American students. This was just the beginning of integration, though. So, sports in particular proved a very difficult issue for integration. Dunbar had placed Lufkin on the map through its superior athletic program, which had just won the state championship shortly before integration. Integrating the two schools' football team proved much more difficult than it had in nearby cities. Larry Kegler had graduated from Lufkin High by 1970, but he had been the only black player on Lufkin's team for several years under freedom of choice. Reflecting on integrating the football team, he commented that trying to put Dunbar's Hall of Fame football team with Lufkin High's football that never won anything was going to be tough. And it was. Because the all-district, all-state players that Dunbar had and you couldn't take white, Mr. So-and-so's son, out of his position. It was hard. My belief that was the hardest part. And the assistant principal that we met at the beginning of all this, Herbert Cross, concurred. He remembered that when the white coach at Lufkin High demanded that the new black arrivals play by his system, many of the black students decided to just not play on the football team anymore. The few that did play refused to talk to the white coach and ignored him when he spoke. They only communicated with the African-American assistant coach. Many of the former Dunbar athletes felt like their head coach, Elmer Red, who had led them to victory in the state championship, had been forced out by integration. And in a way, they were right. Most of the African-American coaches were fired as a result of integration, as were quite a few of the African-American teachers. Gloria Turan, who was one of the first African-American counselors in the Lufkin schools, remarked that as a result of the tension and fighting in the football program, quote, they had to have the law out nearly every day to the school. So integration at Lufkin High School was not as smooth as possible, as the principal said. But over time, tensions did ease. For those who experienced integration within Lufkin, some things changed while others stayed very much the same. And down Highway 59 in Nacogdoches, we can see direct action taking place. So Nacogdoches um, was a bit different than Lufkin, and that's largely because of SFA. So in NAC, we can see direct action coming from an extremely active NAACP with a seasoned and active leader, Arthur Weaver, and the students at Stephen F. Austin State University. SFA had integrated during the mid-1960s and had a growing population of African-American students from other cities and a more liberal faculty and student body than the population of the rest of the town. African-American students began organizing on campus. In the late 1960s, they formed a chapter of the National Black Students Association, and following the 1968 assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., an organization called the King's Men to address problems on campus as well as the common experience of African-American students and people in the town. The King's Men did not last very long, but they did organize a successful protest march on December 7th of 68 against a Washateria that had remained segregated even four years after the Civil Rights Act. And they forced an extremely reluctant university administration to publicly support their protest. SFA students later organized marches throughout uh, 1968 and into 1970, uh, one of which is pictured here. Um, this was a combination of protests about treatment of African American students on campus, as well as continued segregation in downtown businesses. Uh, in particular, this protest was about um, African Americans not being hired by downtown businesses. Um, so, it wasn't just about the college, it was also about Nacogdoches as a whole. And they also protested what they saw as continued police brutality, which was a problem in Nacogdoches. I can't keep going with stories of sit-ins. There were many in Lufkin, including a big one at Erie Queen. More marches, voter registration drives, and more. Suffice to say that the Civil Rights Movement definitely came to Deep East Texas and left a lasting legacy. We always ended each interview we did for CRBB by asking the person where they thought we were now. 
Most people noted how far we had come, but how far we had to go. Perfect cross is different. We started with him, it's appropriate we end with him. He was not very optimistic in the summer of 2016. Reflecting on the city of Lufkin, he remarked, quote, this community, we are integrated, but we are not integrated. It's something else. There's just a lot of diehard people and they're not going really to integrate nothing. And that was the moment when we spoke to him. And that's where we come in. So, during the summer of 2016, uh, that's when I was hired to work for Civil Rights in Black and Brown. So, what we do, uh, we go out and we interview people in Texas who were involved in the Civil Rights Movement, um, either African American or Mexican American, uh, because there was two Civil Rights Movements in Texas that happened simultaneously. Uh, we didn't do as much with Mexican Americans in Lufkin and Nacogdoches because there weren't as many um, at that time. But there were people down in Corpus doing interviews. There were people down in Brownsville doing interviews. We were spread out all across the state. And um, we were split into teams. So it was my partner and I. You can see the back of our heads here doing this interview uh, with the head of the NAACP in Nacogdoches. Um, so we were hired to conduct and analyze oral histories. We spoke with so many people. If you go to our website, you can access all of the interviews that we did. They're searchable by place and topic. Um, and it's all for We trace the theme of deeply embedded racism, violence, survival, and perseverance. It's even more important for us to reckon with the past now, especially when in our own backyard. The conversations and debates we have today about everything you see on the news are not new. These roots are deep. We've done an inadequate job of digging them up and out. We have to remember we have to contextualize. We have to listen to those who have stories to tell. We have to reckon with the history and the present in our own homes and our societies. And CRBD is a part of that contextualization, part of understanding where we've been and helping us make a map to where we need to go. And it's a privilege to still be affiliated with the project. Thank you guys, and if anybody has any questions, I would be happy to answer them to the best of my ability. You know when the book will be out, Meredith? Next year. I so, mean, any, just sometime next year? Uh, so, right now, and I don't know how much COVID might have slowed things down, but um, so the plan is how it worked was each of us wrote a chapter. So the people up here in this picture, each of us wrote a chapter. So mine's on Lufkin and Nacogdoches. Uh, my partner wrote about the other place we went to, Conroe. So we did a month in Lufkin and Nacogdoches, and we did a month in Conroe. Um, so she's writing about Conroe. Um, and it um, should be out with the University of Texas Press late summer, early fall. Will it be available on Amazon, Books yeah. and Nail? It'll be available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, your favorite bookstore retail. And then tell us again what the website is to go and listen oh, to the it's oral history. Uh, CRBD.tcu.edu. Let me go back to the beginning because it's on the flyer. <coughs> so it's down here at the bottom. Uh, it wasn't just TCU that did this project, so we hosted it on our web server. So that's why it's tcu.edu. Um, but this was a partnership with UT, uh, UNT, University of North Texas, UT Arlington, um, and it was funded through the NEH. Um, my partner is at Duke University. In fact, I was the only person from TCU on the team. Um, so this was a huge project involving a lot of people from a lot of places. It sounds like a lot of very well-educated young people. Did you find that there to be much difference between Nacogdoches and Lufkin in your analysis? There, there was a lot of differences based on kind of their backstories. Um, so, whenever Nac High uh, integrated, there wasn't as much pushback, um, and if it was, it was very much kind of that private grumbling. Whereas Lufkin, it was big and explosive, and. Our best theory as to why there was that difference is the fact that Nacogdoches had that different kind of culture. 
they weren't going to be big and explosive like that. Whereas Lovekin, they didn't have any kind of centralizing force there. Um, there wasn't really like a, a family that was in, you know, like Dieball. When Arthur Temple said Dieball was going to integrate, by golly, Dieball integrated. Right, right. Um, Lufkin didn't have that. And so it was, what's interesting though is Nacogdoches did have a worse problem with police brutality than Lufkin did. Uh, the chief of police in Nacogdoches is infamous for being a wee bit of a monster. <laughs> um, but in Lufkin, you didn't have that. To make it local, Pine Tree and Longview had completely polar opposites situations. In my graduating class, I, mean, I was a senior going in in 1970. I graduated in 71. There were two black students, mm -hmm. two, in my senior class. Both of their parents were teachers. And they were A students, mm -hmm. and they were lovely people. Not that that makes a difference, but Longview High School had like 400 yeah. black students entering. And the, the magnitude and the percentage, totally different. Created it, a different situation entirely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not that unusual. This, the, I said it was from Huntington. Even when I was in school back in the early 2000s, we didn't have that many African-American kids in our school. Well, we welcome, you know, we welcome all of them. My, my memory is very different than all of you. Do you think we could link that website to the historical museum website? Would they have a problem with that? I don't see why not. That would be interesting history, too. So we could listen to the oral history through the museum website. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I'm sure you had you know certain um, expectations going in. What surprised you the most then from your research? That's a really good question. Um, I think what surprised me the most was how little I knew. I went into it a little bit like, oh, I'm being assigned to my home area. I literally am going to stay at my parents' house. Um, and there's just a lot that hasn't been told um, that should be, because uh, these were huge events. Um, and we got everything cooperated, by the way. So um, I know one question I've had when I've talked about CRBV before is, you know, how do you know that this one interview is, is accurate? They're, they're all corroborated. My dad was at Lufkin High when they integrated. Mm -hmm. He remembers that happening. Um, so I think, yeah, that was probably the most surprising, the fact that there's so much history that's not written down, it's not documented in what we consider the traditional sources, things like newspapers, government documents, and if you don't get these interviews, you don't get the discussion with these people, you lose the stories. Which, as I said, we've got a big gaping hole where Greg County and Tyler need to go. We yeah. just ran out of time. And funding. Did y'all go as far south as Byron? We did. That was not my team, but they did, yes. Um, yeah, they did. We hit the big cities, so we did Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio. Um, we had a team that went out to West Texas, um, and then South Texas. So we we did miss some places. Like we didn't really do a good job with the Panhandle, um, and again here we just didn't get um, into Tyler and Longview because we had to go down south to Conroe. Sure. Right. Yeah. Which was an experience. Did yeah. you get a chance to compare and contrast Lufkin and Mac today versus how it was? Mm. That's a great question. Um, so we um, actually, the, the last picture on the slide is an interview we did because that was a big question we had. How much do we want to talk about today and how much do we want to keep this in the civil rights <coughs> era, so kind of post-World War II to let's say 1980? Um, we decided we were going to take whoever would let us interview them. Um, so this picture on the right, um, it's kind of hard to tell, it's a little pixelated, but he's a young man. Uh, he's the head of the NAACP in Nacogdoches. We actually interviewed a 19-year-old um, because she is trying to keep her community's history alive. Um, so she knew a lot about it. Um, so we did a little bit of comparing and contrasting. Um, Honestly, I'd say the biggest influence on Nacogdoches um, is SFA. Uh, it's nearly impossible to separate Nacogdoches from SFA. Um, whereas with Lufkin, it's more a, a discussion of deindustrialization. 
um, if you're looking at today, it's about what happens when a city loses almost all of its industry, yeah. almost simultaneously. Right. Um, so, and that's, <laughs> I had to make a decision when I was writing the chapter. I was like, how much do I want to dive into this? I wound up not diving into it very much, which is a shame because that is a story that needs to be told. Um, I graduated from um, Lee High School in Tyler in 1968 and um, went on off to college. And so I wasn't there when really desegregation came to Tyler. But the word on the, the word that I remember hearing was that they brought outside agitators into our community right. to yeah. demonstrate. And I wonder if you found that to be true or if that was just um, you know, a rumor. It's a rumor. Mm -hmm. So that happened. I, now, I can't speak 100% for Tyler. Um, but what we did find, so the paper in Lufkin, George Wallace came to Lufkin. Uh, no, in, in 68 as part of his campaign, which it, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with who he is. He's the former extraordinarily racist governor of Alabama. Um, oh, yeah. So the segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever yeah. guy. Um, he came to Lufkin as part of his campaign and a huge protest showed up at the airport. And the paper claimed outside agitators. Well, what we found was it was Lufkin High students. Well, not Lufkin High. It was Dunbar High at the time. Um, it was the African American high school students um, because we talked to some of them. Um, so, oh. a lot of times that's used as kind of a "our people know their place" type mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. But we didn't find it to be true in Lufkin and Nacogdoches anyway. Sort of like we were surprised to learn the bus bombings here were by local men. We because initially the FBI was saying that it had to be from outside. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. It was my job. Yeah, like everybody who showed up that day when Lufkin integrated, they, they lived there, or they had stu they had kids there. It was not outside people. Mm -hmm. Nice job, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you're interested, it's an entire lecture series. So next week is Oil for Victory about the big inch. And if you want to hear from me again, I'll be talking about women, <laughs> um, August 27th, which is my other, um, I feel so weird to describe it as a passion, but <laughs> my other passion when it comes to history is women's history. So come hear me talk about that, August 27th. <laughs> Does anybody else need a, a brochure on the rest of the time?